inhabitants of the territory comprised within the present limits of the town of Orange, or, or as, as such, such limits, limits may be hereafter altered, altered by law, law shall, shall constitute, constitute and, continue and continue a body, politic, and corporate, a body, politic, and corporate, a body, politic, and corporate known as, as the, the town, town of, of Orange. As the town of Orange. <laughs> The town shall have exercise and enjoy all the rights, immunities, powers, and privileges, and be subject to all the duties and obligations now pertaining to and incumbent on it as a municipal corporation, and shall have perpetual succession, may sue and be sued, implead and be impleaded, contract and be contracted with, and may have a corporate seal which it may alter at its pleasure by proper ordinance. With these words, the town of Orange, Virginia, became legitimate. On June 3, 1872, the residents of the village voted to incorporate as a town with a mayor and town council. But a settlement had existed here for as much as 150 years prior to 1872. And so to tell the story of the town of Orange, we must start at the beginning with the indigenous people, followed by the settlers who came in from the east. Animals would be hunted in this area because this, there was a pass in the mountains here that the animals would come to. I'm sure the archaics camped in this area, but all of the evidences that I'm aware of uh, in, the, in the town of Orange uh, have been obliterated. The countryside was actually um, was heavily forested in many areas, but you did have areas of grassland. Um, there was quite a lot of climax forest around. Um, of course, some softwood, some hardwood. When you start coming up out of the tidewater, you encounter what the settlers used to call the Little Mountains. Uh, the first good pass through those mountains that you find is exactly where the town of Orange is located. He was an early explorer. He was a county surveyor. Uh, he uh, rode with Spotswood. And when he was taking out his patents, he patented actually the land upon which the town of Orange now sits. In the 1720s, two roads were cleared through, through this area, and they crossed right at the point of the town of Orange. At the town of Orange, what you had were a few small settlements by then. These are very, very minor structures. These are one-roomed structures. Some of them are so-called earthfast. In other words, they're set in the ground. You'll see dimensions like 16 by 10, uh, 15 by 15. One house is probably a two-room house, and then some bigger tobacco barns. Of course, tobacco is the uh, cash crop. You even see things that are so minor that they don't even have walls. They're raftered houses. They're literally like an A-frame, a roof that sits on the ground. Certainly by 1749, uh, we were beginning to have some established, uh, some established buildings here. We had at least two taverns. One of those taverns was owned by Timothy Crosthwaite. And that's where, in 1749, the Orange County Courthouse was relocated from its original site on the Rapidan River. It started holding court in the tavern, and ultimately it bought the tavern and two acres uh, for the county lot and took over uh, the Timothy Crossway Tavern to be their courthouse. In 1752, a new courthouse was built on the public lot, bounded by today's Short Street, Church Street, Chapman Street, and Main Street. And in 1804, it moved again to where the Levy Building is today. William Bell bought both the William Crosswaite's 100 acres and the 98 remaining acres of Timothy Crosswaite's property. 
and the tavern was known as the William Bell Tavern. And the Bell Tavern is particularly interesting because Bell keeps on, you know, of course you had to, um, had to renew your tavern license. 1779, he has his last renewal. Unfortunately, he dies the next year. And his wife then applies for the tavern license, and she runs the tavern um, as the tavern keeper for several more years. And she is somewhat representative, I think, of the entrepreneurial women that people don't tend to think of as existing in the 18th and 19th century. It appears that Vidir came through Orange, went to West Virginia, you know, seeking his fortune sort of thing, and then came back to Orange. And when he came back to Orange, he bought the William Bell property and began developing it even further. And Verdeer does his part by dividing up his property and selling lots along a street. And he convinces the turnpike company to come and run that turnpike up through that street. And that essentially produces the town of Orange that we know of today. In Francis Taylor's diary, as late as the 1780s, the latter part of the 1780s, you still got wolves running around this town. Uh, maybe they're not running down the middle of Main Street, but he says you can hear them uh, up on Quarles Mountain at night, howling. And they are still having wolf hunts. You have at least one circus that comes to town around that time, because Taylor actually notes that he he came to town one day and he saw a camel being walked down the road with, with a rug on its back to keep it warm. The circus had come to town, probably a camel, probably a couple of performing dogs, and maybe, you know, given the tenor of the times, maybe a tightrope walker. James Madison certainly appeared occasionally, uh, and other prominent people appeared occasionally. Marquis de Lafayette came, and of course, um, he, um, he loved a good dinner, he loved a good speech, and uh, when, he came, um, when he came through in the mid-1820s, of course, he was greeted like a great hero, and he, he got to dance with the pretty girls, he got to make speeches, he, got, he, he was fed very well. Walter Jones did very, very well there. He became a very respected shoe and boot maker. He became a landowner in the town of Orange. He actually is one of the few free blacks who married in a church. Walter Jones and his wife, um, they're married actually in St. Thomas Church by the minister. The town of Orange was a busy place back then because it was a courthouse town. During court days, people thronged to this village, not only to attend to their legal affairs, but to conduct business and to socialize. In 1835, there were over 50 homes located in the town, or what, or what they would have considered in the town. In 1835, um, uh, nine businesses, nine stores, I should say. Uh, these were you know, various types of merchant stores. Um, two schools, two brick churches, um, a, a wide plethora of trades, um, um, establishments like blacksmiths, uh, wheelwrights, cobblers, um, you know, peop uh, businesses or enterprises of that caliber, uh, newspaper, office. So Orange as a town was, was um, operating at a very high level. In 1854, something came to the town of Orange that would play a central role in the town's economy for the next 50 years or more, the railroad. Because it came through the pass in the Little Mountains, 
it forced the county to move its courthouse again to where the William Bell Tavern Orange Hotel once stood. That was done in 1859. Two years later, America plunged into the Civil War. Orange felt the effects of that conflict for all four of its years, from as early as the first major land engagement in July of 1861. And on July the 23rd, uh, Fanny Page Hume, a young diarist living just outside of town, uh, reported coming into town and a train had arrived with wounded from that battle. From the spring of 1862 to the spring of 1864, Orange was on the front line. And on August the 2nd, 1862, uh, they, there was a cavalry excursion in this direction, Union Cavalry wound up fighting the 7th Virginia Cavalry in Main Street Orange. And on July the 4th, 1863, General Lee begins withdrawing from Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. By the first week of August, the Confederate Army is in Orange, and they are beginning to develop what will become something they call the Rapidan Line, a 20-mile-long complex of earthworks. Most of the Army of Northern Virginia, along with Robert E. Lee, spent the winter of 1863-64 in Orange, behind that line of defensive earthworks along the Rapidan River. The war finally left after the horrific Battle of the Wilderness in May of 1864 in eastern Orange County, and the town of Orange started to recover. The town's infrastructure uh, really wasn't ever damaged, uh, and the infrastructure of the region had been reestablished uh, because both the Union and Confederate armies had moved away uh, by uh, late May of 1864, and so there was another, there was about a whole year in which uh, businesses could be reestablished and start doing business with the North because the armies were gone. And so they were poised. Uh, Orange was poised to do business, uh, and in fact was doing business before the war was over. Alexander Daly is an interesting fellow. He is an Irish immigrant, again, one of the people who, um, who came here. Uh, he bought property on the south edge of Orange, or uh, the, what became the town of Orange, and built the house called Chestnut Hill in the 1850s, and had a very extensive um, leatherworking and tanning operation. Um, this tale of um, a Masonic apron uh, being stolen by, by a Civil War soldier in 1864 from Orange. And the apron apparently belonged to a Mason by the name of William H. Clore. And the, uh, the, the apron traveled um, to the West Coast and all the way back during the next uh, 100 plus years. And uh, the, uh, the apron uh, came back the uh, story of the, ma the um, aprons travels across the country uh, is written uh, on the back of the, uh, of the apron itself. Again, we have um, many years until 1872, the Civil War had came and went. Uh, and then finally in 1872, um, for whatever reason, the, the, um, the majority of the vote qualified voters within the town limits or within the limits of Orange uh, petitioned uh, the county court to hold this election. And in June 1872, that election happened. Now, why, why was there these, these long gaps? Why did it never happen? My own personal opinion 
And I don't know if we'll ever be able to know this, was that there was probably an attitude of, if it ain't broke, we don't need to fix it. The railroad and the prosperity that came with it continued to grow. Eventually, Orange would have four railroads, running either to it or through it. Railroads were the dot-com of their day, and they carried and attracted and conducted business wherever they went, and Orange just absolutely boomed. Railroad Avenue was the main street for quite some time. Regrettably, not much is known about the enslaved community in the town of Orange itself. In general, town residents didn't own slaves, but rented them from landowners to work as household servants instead. I do know where some of these people that went to these churches uh, were enslaved. Mm -hmm. You know, some were in Montebello. You know, some were, um, it's a plantation out off of uh, Rock 20, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, that way... So there were uh, plantations all around, but uh, when African Americans, when they when they became free, you know, they they started assembling together because they supported one another and so forth, you know, and that's how, and building that's how they built communities. It should be pointed out that not all blacks were enslaved. The general data that we have would indicate that approximately 10 percent of the black population before the Civil War were free. Following the Civil War, emancipated blacks established freedmen's communities that were typically centered around a church. In the town of Orange, two such communities may have existed. This church was originally started on a plantation where the, um, the slave master allowed them to have church on the plantation. Um, when they were freed, they came into the town of Orange uh, built the church um, in a place called Sandy Bottom. Uh, we don't know exactly where that is, but we think we might know in the general area uh, out on off of Route 20, uh, just a little ways outside of the town. Going towards uh, Graham Cemetery, you know, where you have that bottom um, and so forth. Um, and it's near the railroad track that goes mm -hmm. out. You have a pretty well-established group of poor whites, blacks, of course, in some cases people who were free before the war, such as uh, Walter Jones, he's down there. And they appear to be on the eastern edge of, um, of the town, probably somewhere around Bird Street, just outside of the of the uh, town limits in 1872. Some of them owned property, some of them rented. Nicholas Clark, originally from Culpeper, apparently he marries an orange girl. He moves down here. He is a saddle baker. His father is a Revolutionary War veteran, also free. With the help of a second major rail line coming through in 1880, Orange became something of a boom town with a wide variety of businesses, including numerous hotels and bars. And a nickel could get you a full glass of whiskey back then. In fact, Peter Moncure, who was an absolute monster of a human being, would go in and put his nickel down on the bar. The glass would be put in front of him. He would circle the glass with his fingers all the way around and they would pour the whiskey up onto his fingers. Let's talk about George Gaines, who's running his saloon uh, in, in the town of Orange along the railroad tracks. Uh, his was the primary watering hole uh, in, in the town. George was extraordinarily well known and uh, ran a good business. 
George lived with Ruth Henshaw up on Bird Street. George is white, Ruth is black. They have children, they're never legally married. Upon George's death, he leaves property to Ruth and to those children. No one disturbed that will. People understood and respected George and Ruth. The town of Orange came into the 20th century poised to become a leader among Virginia municipalities. Business was booming, and something exciting was happening down on the street. A newfangled contraption known as the horseless carriage. Uh, in 1906, I believe, um, of the 600 registered cars within the entire Commonwealth of Virginia, 40 of them were located here in Orange. And, you know, that may, 40 may not sound like a lot, but if we look at the proportion of that to only 600 for the entire state, that's a very significant number. Chapman Avenue uh, especially is kind of where the epicenter, it was the automotive retail center of, of the town, maybe of this, this part of the state, I don't know. Yeah, the, uh, the commercial scene uh, in Orange, the business scene in Orange was really thrived from from uh, the end of the 19th century all the way through, uh, up through the early 20th century, you had a huge array, wide variety of diverse businesses that encompassed almost every kind of commercial activity that, that you could think of. Um, it wasn't just limited to retail. Uh, there was even, you know, light industrial. There's the many professional uh, men, doctors, lawyers, uh, optometrists, dentists, um, you know, other professionals. He was pro a proponent and a practicer of the mayoral type of town management in which basically the mayor is the king, the mayor is the emperor. And in fact, uh, he exercised his prerogatives to the point of building his home on East Main Street. This was across Main Street, East Main Street, from today's 7-Eleven store, and he deliberately jutted his house lot out into East Main Street with nobody daring to complain and built a tower on that house, and he would go up in that tower and survey his domain. The, the town voted for a town council form of government, uh, doing away with the mayoral form of government. And Frank Perry went back to his home and hung himself in that tower. A.J. Harlow's a really uh, interesting guy. He was a preacher, a Baptist preacher, came to Orange in 1893. He was uh, essentially Orange's first true industrialist. Uh, he was, a, he was a, a, an entrepreneur. Um, he um, established a real estate firm. He established an undertaking business. Preacher A.J. Harlow, in 1902, built his uh, electric generating plant, which uh, consisted of an 80 horsepower uh, dynamo generator um, he erected that plant on Carolina Avenue um, on a creek, which is in the, the vicinity of where the firehouse is located today. He, uh, he also um, was a supplier of ice to, the, uh, to the, the people and the businesses in town. On November 8th, 1908, at 5.30 in the morning, disaster struck. A fire started in a second-story sleeping apartment above Ricketts Drugstore on Railroad Avenue. 
Um, the fire burned uh, approximately the north half of Railroad Avenue, burned it down, um, moved to, to Main Street at the railroad tracks, burned down the large uh, levee building, um, which got rebuilt uh, the next year, jumped across the railroad tracks um, on East Main Street, burned down the buildings on the north side, burned down the buildings on the south side, burned down the the uh, the Orange Baptist Church when it was located there. Uh, they lost their brand new $1,500 pipe organ, which had never even been played in a worship service before. Probably a combination of the, the townspeople um, pulling together, forming a bucket brigade, and the arrival of the, the um, Charlottesville um, Fire Department by train. Um, they sent a couple dozen men and and uh, wagons and horses and a fire engine, you know, via train. Some other things which probably played a role um, on on Main Street as you went away from the railroad tracks toward the courthouse, um, the large building which is known as the Sanford Building, really large, impervious, fireproof, you know, wall essentially helped to keep the flames from spreading any farther in that direction. And so many merchants rushed back in even before the, uh, uh, even before the embers had finally cooled off and started rebuilding because they just knew that this was the center of their commerce and they had to reconstruct it. Dr. Ricketts did not build back on Railroad Avenue. He went and bought a lot. It's directly across Madison Road from the courthouse. And that is, he removed a hotel that was there on that site and built his drugstore. And why? Because he could see the automobile was coming. And he got ready to, for Orange to stop being a railroad town and to become an automobile town, which it did. Yes, there was another fire in July 1909, um, eight months or so after the 1908 fire. And this fire was just as devastating as the, the great fire of 1908. Um, the, the fire of 1909 um, destroyed about 23 buildings. Um, the 1908 fire only destroyed about 20 buildings. Uh, the, the 1909 fire um, caused about anywhere from $75,000 to $100,000 of damage in, in 1909 dollars, which translates to about $3.15 million today. This same area was hit with another very destructive fire. <clears throat> and every building between where the Nazareth Baptist Church sits today, every building between that church and the building that housed the Orange Review office was destroyed. There was an organized uh, fire department or fire company in Orange as early as 1901. And we see this evidence uh, repeated in newspaper accounts that, that listed early officers in the fire company. Um, again, also in 1911, we have this same confirmation that uh, the, the fire company did exist. Uh, in 1921, apparently, there was, there was some change, and, and we think maybe um, it's when the, the fire company was officially chartered, um, because that's when the fire company, you know, claim, that's what, uh, the date that the fire company claims its birthday as, 1921. And 
and Tolls was decidedly curious. Uh, eloquent, well-educated, and uh, uh, somewhat allergic to work. On the other hand, Tolls uh, volunteered, became a member of one of the Orange County companies, fought in the 13th Virginia Regiment, was wounded in the Battle of the Wilderness. Uh, he received a permanent disability as a result of his wound, walks to Nason's, and this is after the Civil Wars, and teaches in a black school. As the town grew in size, so did the services it offered its citizens. Things we've grown to expect, such as law enforcement, water, and sewer. Springs and wells, of course, initially were the source of water, and sewer was uh, uh, throwing stuff where you thought people wouldn't find it, and it wouldn't get in the way. And that was not working. With people having animals in the town, cattle, chicken, uh, hogs, and uh, not, not very effectively disposing of their garbage, and having outhouses, uh, maybe rudimentary cesspools and that sort of thing, typhoid would break out. Uh, ultimately, uh, several springs east of town were collected into a spring box and piped to town. Really, uh, a, a a well-engineered, comprehensive water and sewer system did not come into existence until General William Knoll, uh, a retired Army engineer living in Culpeper, uh, actually uh, designed a uh, water and sewer system for the town. Um, the first school that we know of for the education of white children was uh, located on Caroline Avenue um, behind what would now be Orange Tire in a, in a brick uh, two-story building. Um, that school was in operation uh, at least uh, in 1900 and probably predates 1900 by, by several years. Uh, then the school um, for um, white children uh, was moved up Bellevue Avenue to where the the old high school um, was built in 1910. Then in 1925, the annex to the high school was constructed. Now, the, the first school in the town of Orange for the education of black children that we know about um, was located where Preddy's Funeral Home is located today. And that school was in operation um, by the 1890s. And, and then from there, uh, it moved to the greatest school, um, which you would have to go to, through Lindsay Drive to get to it, or you could go up to Prospect. It's, it's, it's at Prospect. Actually, there's a marker there. Right. And, and I think they operated until 58 or 59. He was an advocate for um, education of black youth. And um, one of his, his son was attending the school at near Pretty's, and he came home one day with lice, okay? And Mr. East was upset, and he went to the school board and petitioned for that school. Not only was retail business booming in the town of Orange in the first half of the 20th century, but so was manufacturing. I, I mentioned the Rapidan Railroad. Uh, 1921, coming from <clears throat> Wolftown, Rapidan, uh, to Orange, it had uh, dammed up Baylor Run and uh, had a huge shallow lake into which it was dumping its logs. The railroad rather abruptly announced that it was going to shut down, and lo and behold, it did. And then uh, the town is casting about uh, for someone to 
come in and operate some sort of an industry, give, give some employment to some of the people locally. And there were contacts in New York with Orange and vice versa. And by 1929, uh, the American Silk Mills Corporation had built a plant right on top of where that lake had been. So they invited uh, Milton Rubin down to look at the property. And he came by train, like everybody did. Half the businessmen in Orange met Milton Rubin at the train. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And they walked up to the brand new James Madison Hotel for, so, for lunch. And Milton Rubin later told me they were so nice to me that I couldn't turn them down. When they were going full steam, they kept adding every year during the Depression. Orange, in a base, in a really never suffered from the Depression. The, basically, the women were working in the mills and the men were working on the farms and the stores and the shops. And uh, Orange was humming. It really was. Manufacturing uh, really hit its stride, as in a lot of places, during World War II in Orange. Um, Sneed and Company, um, which was located on the former Orange County Fairgrounds property, they manufactured uh, pontons, or common folks call it pontoons. Uh, they also manufactured um, uh, fuel tanks for aircraft. They uh, did really well, um, had, a, had a, a booming operation. You know, over 600 people um, were employed um, at Sneed & Company. Because both the Silk Mill and Sneed & Company were manufacturing materials being used in the war effort, security in the town of Orange was heightened during World War II. Well, I went with my father out to the Carter property next to the cemetery. And there was a shack built out on the hill. And that shack was manned 24-7 by volunteers who were called spotters. And what you were looking for was air activities. The railroad's rights of way that you see going right past today's railroad station, the 1910 railroad station, that was a major north-south choke point. And destroying the railroad anywhere between Orange and Rapidan uh, could, could cause great consternation. Uh, you talk about supply chain problems. And at the very beginning of the first, Second World War, the military came down here and posted guards at the bridge over the Rapidan. At oh, one time, there was snow on the ground. In World War I, World War II, the convoy is coming through town. Coming from south, I don't know where from. Anyhow, they come around the curb at at the uh, um, courthouse, and the first one slipped sideways and stacked up against Rick and Drugstore. The second one did the same thing. <laughs> And we had about a dozen more <laughs> stacked up before they stopped them from coming and <laughs> getting get them loose. <laughs> See, something always happened to it. Like all American towns, World War II had a lasting effect on the town of Orange, sending its young men to war, some of whom would never come home. Andrew Maples was from a, um, a very patriotic 
family. His father was in World War I. Uh, he was, his, his brother and, and he, you know, two of them were Tuskegee Airmen. Okay. Um, Captain Maples was deployed to Italy and uh, he went out on a mission um, and we experienced um, trouble, engine trouble. He uh, called back in um, and he was headed back, never made it. And uh, what, what was unusual, I'm an Air Force guy, by the way. <laughs> um, what was unusual um, in, in a situation like that, um, he would not have come back by himself. You know, he would have been escorted back by another, with another fighter to make sure he got back safe. Captain Maples told his wingman they needed him for the mission. He could make it back. So he went back by himself and he didn't make it. And they never found him. As the town moved through the 20th century, it continued to grow and prosper. In 1949, the town recognized that they needed some kind of uh, well-equipped, safe um, place uh, centrally located in town for kids to, to have some recreation. Sports were a popular activity in the town of Orange, particularly football. And baseball. Since before it was incorporated as a town, Orange has been served by numerous newspapers. Since 1931, the Orange Review has had its offices in the town of Orange. In 1949, WJMA Radio joined the newspaper in serving the town and county. Scouts uh, in the United States dates back to 1910. Uh, in Orange, however, in 1915 is when Boy Scouting started here. That first Boy Scout troop, which was known as Orange Troop Number no. One, now known as as Troop 14, that Boy Scout troop uh, had uh, members of many of Orange's prominent families at that time. Troop 111 was the first black, first all-black Boy Scout troop in Orange County. Um, it was organized in the fall of 1967. And this is at a time in the, in the late 60s when, when desegregation was, was happening in, in Virginia and Orange and other places around the country. Um, so this, it was really fortuitous. <laughs> had my key, of course, unlocked the door and went on in to do my thing, set my purse down on the counter. This man steps out from what was the ladies' room. All right, now you just be calm. 
Nothing's going to happen to you if you do what you're told. So, finally, I sat out on the floor there, and somehow or another, I don't even know the combination now, but I used the combination and I opened it. When he went by that window, I knew he was gone. So I punched all the buttons I could find, the, the alarm buttons. <laughs> Eleanor Roosevelt came and stopped at the tea room on, I believe it was the one on Main Street, near where the post office was. Um, she stopped, this was way before you had Secret Service and all the other folks. Uh, apparently she and a friend just drove up and thought this looked like a nice place to stop. I climbed the standpipe twice, both times at night. <laughs> it, it was crazy. The second time on my way down, a boy named Hershey Thompson, he turned the corner there and he had a spotlight like the police used to have, you know. Mm -hmm. And he cut that thing up there and hit me. And I thought to myself, if he tells my daddy, if he knows who it is and tells my daddy, that's going to be the end of me. <laughs> because of the automobile, the business center of town moved from Railroad Avenue to Main Street and Chapman Street. This shift opened up Railroad Avenue to the African-American population as its own business and social center. I'm coming up on an, an alley, and uh, th this alley um, is known to be the dividing uh, line between the, um, the black and the white sections of town. In other words, from this area all the way back to um, the Mill Street area was a predominantly black residential and business area. Okay, now uh, just past the alley, um, the, this row of, of buildings here uh, were African American uh, businesses. I would say one was a grocery store. Uh, it was called Sunny South. There was another cafe um, and a restaurant here that used to be called Mary's Lunch. Um, also, there was a pool room. And uh, out of that pool room, they also ran a uh, taxi service. You can visualize uh, people, uh, especially on Saturdays, people uh, up and down Short Street, uh, this being filled with people. There, there is a significance to this place because this was a gathering place. Uh, the Lipscomb building, it was a barber shop and a beauty shop and it also had a restaurant in it at one time and they had three or four barbers in this um, barber shop and um, they were some of the most well-respected people in, in Orange County. In the late 1960s and early 1970s the intersection of Madison Road and Main Street was becoming increasingly difficult for large trucks to negotiate and so the expressway was born. Also built as an urban renewal project that would rid the town of a slum, it actually destroyed a neighborhood instead. Uh, I estimate um, between 20 and 25 homes uh, removed along Church Street, and there was another uh, street behind Emmanuel uh, called uh, Ten Cup Alley. Yeah, it, it pretty much destroyed it. You know, um, it, it, it removed, um, I would say, half of a population of the African-American uh, community. This is me speaking, uh, my own opinion. Uh, I think that it could have been um, routed a lot better. And the way that it's routed now, I think, is um, might be some of the reasons that Orange has, go has had been going through uh, economic uh, downturn. The mayor of Orange in 1974 stated that the Route 15 Expressway would revitalize downtown Orange. 
So apparently um, in the early 70s, the, the downtown commercial area, the commercial district of Orange um, was in some dire straits. They, they took my uncle's house, it was a, one of the best houses on Church Street. And uh, he had to go down the country uh, and I could see my grandmother sitting across the street there right beside the Bad Baptist Church. First time I ever seen her cry when that big crane came in and towed that house there. That was one of the saddest days of my life to see my grandmother cry. Yes. Yes, indeed. This was originally constructed about 1900. It was known as the Crittenden Building um, back when it was first built and has housed a, um, a wide variety of, of commercial uh, enterprises uh, over the years. This location here, um, which now houses uh, the Finders Keepers uh, Antique Store, um, this uh, is the location of the former uh, Coleman Hotel. Uh, Coleman House Hotel was established in the in the 1890s and operated for for many many years up into the early 20th century. In this part of the block, um, this is where a a very old uh, brick bank used to stand uh, at the turn of the of the 20th century. This was the um, the Orange uh, Citizens Bank. The big building I'm standing in front of right now with the columns and the, the uh, pediment uh, over the doorway is the, this building was built um, near the turn of the century. This building was built in uh, 1909. Uh, the building that sat here before this one was destroyed in the fire of 1908. Uh, it was built by Emil Levy and it housed a mercantile store. It was often referred to as the most well-equipped mercantile store or department store uh, that the county had to offer. After the, both the fire of 1908 and the fire of 1909, the building that used to sit here in 1908 was the weight and tuning furniture store. That building was built in 1895. A.J. Harlow uh, established the first movie theater in Orange, and not only did this building house his uh, movie theater, but it also housed a, uh, an ice cream shop. This building was utilized by Grimes Drugstore as one of its many locations here in the town of Orange. The Perry building used to be located approximately right here. This is where uh, Mayor uh, Frank Perry uh, used to have his dentist's office. In 1909, this was the location where Dr. L.S. Ricketts, who was a local pharmacist, built his store that he called Ricketts Corner. Um, he envisioned that uh, his location here would be, or would become the commercial hub of downtown Orange. Um, he believed this so thoroughly that he even had a gas pump installed right here in front of the store, where uh, in the 19, beginning in the, in the teens and 1920s, um, people with a uh, new mode of transportation called an automobile could pull up and, and fill up and get a tank of gas. As I cross over uh, Madison Road, the first uh, thing that uh, we come to is the, the large Confederate monument that was erected in 1900. This stands adjacent to the 1859 Orange County Courthouse. It is uh, most distinctive by its uh, large brick tower. This building was built in 1925, and in many of the photographs that were taken during that era, uh, this building is shown very prominently. This building here on my right is Orange Baptist Church. Um, it was built here in 1909. It had to move um, because its former location before 1908 was down on East Main Street, and that church building was destroyed by the Great Fire of 1908. In 1935, the current post office building was built. Um, the building that uh, was located prior to the post office was the Robert E. Lee Tea Room. 
Okay, this building here that now houses the uh, Orange School of Performing Arts, this was the first substantial um, firehouse that was built in the town of Orange. The next building is the Trinity United Methodist Church. It's been in this location on Main Street since the, the early 20th century. Um, I think it's most distinguished by its, its uh, very elaborate uh, bell tower, um, which is still mostly intact today. The building I'm in front of now is the old Orange Opera House. This building was built about 1885. On the upper floor, it housed the um, Orange Masonic Lodge, number 138. They started meeting here in 1885 or thereabouts, and they've been meeting here in the upstairs portion of the building uh, continuously ever since. This building was uh, remodeled. Uh, in the 19, early 1930s and housed the Pitts Madison Theater um, for, for several decades. And that's all I got. As early as the 1970s, the economy of the town of Orange was showing signs of slowing down. Ironically, it could be blamed on something that originally stimulated it. The automobile. In fact, the automobile has totally destroyed some communities uh, because people get in their automobile and go somewhere else to shop. And it is because local merchants could not offer the price and selection that retailers in larger commercial areas or the catalog retailers, which were here before Amazon and uh, Costco and these other folks, Montgomery Ward and Sears and Roebuck, uh, price and selection uh, was hard to offer in a small rural town. It seemed as though it was doing a whole lot better years ago. You know, it would be the place that people would want to come from Gordonsville, Culpeper, Madison. You know, people would want to come to Orange. Orange was a popular place. And you could pretty much get what you want. You know, you could come to Orange and buy a suit. You could buy a pair of shoes. <laughs> you know, you could buy any type of car that was available in Orange, mm -hmm. okay? Um, it wasn't too much that you couldn't get in Orange, uh, hardware stores, um, pretty much feed, anything you needed, Orange had. It should be noted that some businesses stayed, some with three generations in the same family. Until they tore down that whole block where Ricketts was, Mason Insurance Agency was over top of Ricketts from when it was built in like 19... 11 or 12 till they tore it down and I remember someone said it was 23 stairs straight up Ben Hargett called on him from insurance companies before he moved here and he actually slipped and rolled fell down those stairs with the competition of big box stores in larger nearby communities such as Charlottesville Culpeper and Fredericksburg and the ever-expanding world of online shopping Orange finds itself in the 21st century in a position where it must reinvent itself. The town of Orange is located in an absolutely jewel piece of property called Orange County. And if we can figure out a way to merchandise, to market the scenic and historic attractions uh, that are all around the town of Orange, the town will prosper along with the other enterprises. The town, in fact, will be the focal point. Uh, but it's going to require some knowledgeable merchandising. We've got to convert that interest of Orange and Orange County as a place to flee to, as a place to want to go to.
to look around, to enjoy, to appreciate, and to come back to. Now, this is an incredible place to be able to grow up and raise a family. And Kids can still walk downtown if they want to here. It's, I'm not saying it was, it's the way it was in the 50s and 60s when I grew up, but it's still, you know, I don't think your kid's gonna disappear if you're walking downtown. But I, I'm glad I came here and I think that 150 years of a small town that has made it through fires and many destructive things that have come through that they've rebuilt and this town is still alive, a pandemic, you couldn't ask for anything more. They've had a strong, strong backbone with its citizens and support and I wish it a wonderful happy 150th birthday and I'd like to see 200. I've been in this area for 62 out of 67. I've spent a lot of time traveling, but I've always made Orange my home, right? And I will say, of all the places that I've ever been, there's nothing like home. The only way we can make this thing work is to work together. Black, white, blue, green, whatever. We've got to be friends. We've got to be partners. If you're a child of God, you've got to work with each other, you know. All of us God children. we got to stop separating. Yes, that's the only way. I love everybody. Love people. <laughs> Thank you.